Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I welcome you here today on behalf of C. Bradley Thompson, Executive Director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism, for a conversation with Professor Jean Yarbrough on the political chemistry of the Federalists. My name is Michael Hoffpower, and I am Associate Director of the Lyceum Program and Clinical Assistant Professor of Political Science here at Clemson University. The Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and its Lyceum Program are dedicated to the study of the moral, political, and economic foundations of a free society. The Lyceum Program is a great books program that offers a scholarship to incoming students and a minor to current students of Clemson University. Its curriculum ranges from ancient to modern political philosophy to the American founding to the political theory of capitalism. You can learn more by visiting our website at clemson.edu slash lyceum. Tonight's talk is another of our Lyceum lectures, which have been made possible with generous support from the Jack Miller Center. We thank the Jack Miller Center for helping us have conversations centered around the principles and institutions that make a free way of life possible. For more information on the Jack Miller Center, please visit jackmillercenter.org. Before we begin, I'd like to talk about the format of tonight's conversation. Our guest, Professor Yarbrough, will speak with us for a bit before we open up things to a Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk by typing them in the Q&A box. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Yarbrough. Professor Jean Yarbrough is Professor of Government and Gary M. Pendy, Senior Professor of Social Sciences with teaching responsibilities in political philosophy and American political thought at Bowdoin College. She has twice received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, first when she was named a Bicentennial Fellow, and again under a We the People initiative. Professor Yarbrough is the author of American Virtues, Thomas Jefferson on the Character of a Free People. She has edited The Essential Jefferson, and she is also the author of Theodore Roosevelt and the American Political Tradition. It is also to be noted that Professor Yarbrough is on the National Council of the National Endowment of the Humanities. Finally, Professor Yarbrough is the author of numerous articles and essays in American political thought, public policy, and political philosophy. I'd like to thank Professor Yarbrough for joining us this evening. There she is. Okay. Uh, Am I on? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank the Clemson Institute for the study of capitalism and especially to my thanks go out to Professor Hoffpower and also to Patria Hoffpower for their help in setting this up. They have attended to every possible glitch that could go wrong. And in my case, there are numerous possibilities. So thank you again for your help. Um, and now uh, I'd like to talk to you for a little while uh, with this on you about this subject, which has a somewhat unusual title. Um, what do I mean when I talk about the political chemistry of the Federalist? I mean that when the framers met in Philadelphia, they came with a basket full of ideas about how to construct a new government. Let me give you an analogy to cooking. When I was, the, for this past year, restaurants have largely been shut down in Maine. Um, people didn't go out, no one traveled. I, had a I have favorite restaurants all over America, but I've been unable to go to any of them. And so I was compelled to perfect my souffle making skills. Um, 
I discovered that in making numerous souffles over the year, I discovered that if I substituted duck eggs for chicken eggs, if I overbeat the egg whites, if I folded in uh, the egg whites too uh, vigorously into the mix, that the souffle would be a failure. And I think something very similar is going on with the Federalist Papers. Uh, let me uh, suggest to you, let's just get started and look at some of these papers. Um, uh, Federalist number one, um, which was written by Alexander Hamilton, sets out the challenge that is before them when he says, um, it has frequently been reserved uh, to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question of whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice. Note that Hamilton does not say Republican government. Hamilton says good government. Then we come to Madison in Federalist 39. And Madison says that the genius of America is Republican. In other words, Americans will only accept a Republican form of government. So the question arises, is Republican government necessarily good government? We often take for granted that Republican government is good government. It is maybe even the best government, but the authors of the Federalist Papers saw the situation more as a challenge, a challenge that was both rhetorical and institutional. Rhetorical because they have to um, define and persuade um, uh, Americans to accept novel definitions of what federalism is and uh, what republicanism is. At the time of the convention to follow through with this cooking, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cooking chemistry uh, analogy, uh, I would say that there were a number of bad recipes for, Amer for Republican government. Take the Pennsylvania Constitution. The Pennsylvania Constitution established a unicameral legislature. And as you may know from reading the, pencil, the uh, report of the Pennsylvania minority, that is the anti-federalists who opposed the constitution in Pennsylvania, uh, what they wished for and what, and the, federal, the authors of the Federalists talk about this, um, the executive in Pennsylvania was bound to follow the advice of his counsel. Um, uh, in Federalist 22, Alexander Hamilton writes, a single assembly may work for limited, very limited purposes, but it would, in his words, be inconsistent with all the principles of good government. There's that term again, good government, not Republican government, good government. We're all familiar with the outline of uh, the general outlines of the American Constitution. Hamilton tells us in Federalist Paper number nine that the Americans have been able to take advantage of new discoveries in political science that have become known in modern times. And chief among these are uh, the independence of the courts, representation, he lists here the large republic, and finally, the separation of powers. Madison in number 51 goes on to talk about the separation of powers as perhaps the most important structural feature of the Constitution because it arranges those um, institutions so that they provide an internal check on each of the different institutions. And there are the constitutional means and personal motives for each of the different branches to restrain and check the other branches. 
Um, uh, this is very well known to us. I think usually when we talk about the separation of powers, the first idea that comes to mind is this idea of checks and balances. And it's an important idea. Without checks and balances, it would be much easier to expand the reach of government. Um, and But making any piece of legislation run the gauntlet of getting through the House, the Senate, and the executive branch of government to say nothing of judicial challenges is what causes government to slow down and prevents and um, uh, offers some kind of speed bump or um, obstacle to the expansion of government. After all, the framers, even those who defend uh, the Constitution, think there are limits to what government should um, undertake to do, especially if it's going to be effective in what it does. Uh, but I want to suggest, and this is the point of my um, political chemistry uh, uh, title, what I want to suggest is that in, in addition to keeping the branches uh, in check and helping to limit the expansion of government powers, the separation of powers does something else. It encourages its branches, in its branches, precisely those qualities um, uh, that are necessary to good government and so helps to nudge Republican government in the direction of good government and make it a constitution worthy of being adopted. And the place, the a Federalist paper, where I think this comes out best is in Federalist 37. Professor Hofbauer and I were talking in one of our previous meetings about a colleague at the University of Virginia who has as his license plate Fed 49, uh, which he is so fond of. And there are good reasons to like Federalist 49. But if I had to have a, if I had a, li a vanity license plate in the state of Maine, I think I would choose Fed 37. Um, because this is where Madison sketches out uh, um, what I, with some exaggeration for emphasis, call the virtues of good government. I referred to them earlier as qualities, but uh, with a little bit of exaggeration for the sake of emphasis, you can call them the virtues of good government. Here is how he sees the problem in 37. Republican government is attentive to liberty and it is readily responsive to the people's wishes. The genius of Republican government, Madison writes, seems to, re to require that all power be derived from the people. That is, um, Madison takes for granted that republics should be democratic. Um, they should be representative democracies. In making that statement, he's ignoring a great deal of political history. There is Rome, after all, there's the Venetian Republic. They were not democratic republics. But Madison says it seems to be a, a, an attribute of Republican government that all of its powers be derived from the people. And further, that those who are entrusted with these powers hold office only for short terms and that there be a sufficient number uh, to ensure that the wishes of the people are followed. Now that clearly describes of all the branches of government, that clearly describes the House of Representatives. But good government requires in addition to responsiveness, other qualities. It requires stability and energy. And that's what Madison stresses in Federalist 37. Stability um, uh, has different attributes. It requires longer terms. 
you don't uh, you want to be free of the immediate wishes of the people so or the immediate accountability to the people so that you can um, reflect their long term interests rather than just their immediate interests so you are insulated from the uh, whims of the people their immediate reaction to events you have longer terms. And uh, this allows for the Senate to be the branch of government that can put the brakes on either the responsiveness of the House of Representatives or um, a direct pressure from the people themselves. And why does why is this a good thing? Madison tells us that it's a good thing because mutability in legislation is a very bad thing. And what and you can see that. I mean, we see this, I think, regardless of your um, uh, uh, political uh, affiliations or uh, political party that you belong to, you don't want to see when you have a change of administration, just wild swings in foreign policy and domestic policy and tax policy. When you have these wild swings, uh, Madison writes, what this does is really give uh, the inside advantage to those people who are speculators and who are constantly paying attention to every little change in policy so that they can take advantage of it for their own purposes. But for the people as a whole, this mutability in government um, means that there we don't know what the law is. And when you don't know what the law is, it's hard to follow the law. And on top of that, it gives us a very bad name uh, among uh, the nations of the world. Uh, we look like, uh, we, we don't look, uh, um, uh, it, it, responsible when our policies are constantly changing and give the appearance of being in disarray. So Madison says in um, uh, Federalist 62 and 63, these are the principal papers where he uh, uh, defends the institution of the Senate, that the Senate provides stability. And of course, uh, when he's talking about national character, he's also pointing out that it is the Senate that has a role in ratifying treaties. Um, but this is a much better system than having a cabinet of the president have to sign off on all of the treaties that he is negotiating. So Madison sums this up by saying that uh, uh, by trying to bring the elements of good government and Republican government into alignment by emphasizing that the House of Representatives um, uh, contributes responsiveness, that you do want your government to be right there responding to the wishes of the people themselves. But on top of that, you also want the government to be responsible so that we're not seeing too many changes in legislation or too many changes in our foreign policy, because this makes us look like clowns. Uh, and this does not give us the kind of dignity that you would want for Republican government. So this is what he's talking about. There's a tension between the way in which the Americans understand Republican government as being responsive. And you see this over and over again in the anti-federalist arguments that got the problem with the constitution is that it's not responsive, sufficiently responsive to the wishes of the people. There aren't going to be enough representatives. The other institutions are even further removed. Uh, Madison is persuaded that that uh, the House of Representatives will be responsive 
to the wishes of the people and that the Senate will be responsible in reining in the wishes of the people when they are animated by sudden breezes of passion or impulses um, rather than having a, a, a considered opinion on any topic. Another key ingredient of good government, Madison points out in Federalist 37, is energy. Uh, energy is, of course, the province of the executive branch of government. And at the very beginning of Federalist 70, um, uh, which is Hamilton again. And here I'll just pause for one second to say that Madison takes up um, uh, the question of federalism. He takes up the question of Congress. Madison clearly see, thinks that the uh, rights in his uh, one of his federalist papers that he thinks the legislature will be the most powerful branch of government and further that it this somehow the legislature and the Senate are going to be kind of the heart of uh, Republican government. And so these other institutions, which in some sense are questionable, how can you have a strong executive in a Republican form of government? When the Romans, the ancient Romans overthrew their monarchy, what they did was split the executive power of the monarch in half and establish two co-consuls. So if Republican government means anything, it means that it's not monarchical government. We've just made a revolution to overthrow monarchical government. Uh, we've just made a revolution to overthrow the nobles in the House of Lords. So why are we inching our way back to monarchy. Um, that's, of course, the way in which Thomas Jefferson views this. He sees this um, uh, strong executive, especially in the Washington and Adams administrations, as stepping stones, and that's the word he uses, stepping stones back to monarchy. So it falls to Hamilton to defend the, shall we say, the more questionable institutions from, a, from an orthodox democratic Republican point of view. And he is the one who defends both the judiciary and he also defends the executive, but the, the, his defense of the executive stretches out over a number of papers. And they begin at Federalist 70. And um, Hamilton begins that paper by saying, there is an idea abroad in the land that a vigorous executive is inconsistent with the genius of Republican government. You see, when you, when you f look for it, you'll see that they are contrasting Republican government and good government. Good government has certain requirements. How are we going now to define Republican government so that we can include these elements of good government in our understanding of Republican government? And Hamilton's response in number 70 is, for the sake of Republican government, you had better hope that they're wrong. And he goes on to say, energy in the executive is the leading characteristic uh, in the definition of good government. And just to drive the point home, he argues, conversely, a feeble executive results in a feeble execution of the laws and a feeble execution of the laws is by definition bad government. So throughout what Madison has done in Federalist 37 is to set up this tension between good government and self-government. And if you arrange, if you have the right proportions of 
uh, ingredients in each of these governments, you can elicit the qualities or the virtues um, that help to make Republican government good government. And Hamilton goes on in uh, Federalist 70, Federalist 71, and Federalist 72 to talk about those elements of energy that are necessary um, uh, to bring about good government. In 70, he talks about a unitary executive, which is to say he rejects specifically any idea that you should divide executive power, have two or three presidents, um, number one, or that you should bind, tie down the president and make him take the advice of his cabinet, which was the proposal to amend the Constitution and include in the Bill of Rights of the Pennsylvania minority. So we need a, a, a single executive. We need an executive who was going to be in office for a fairly long term. And we need uh, perhaps the most um, uh, a controversial element, we need to have him indefinitely re-eligible for office um, because you never know when uh, there will be a crisis of such proportion and if the president is up for re-election and he's term limited out, you are then um, uh, to use the old cliche, changing horses in midstream. So Madison makes the argument in Federalist 72 that you should be able to continue to reelect the president. And there, an interesting thing is that he points out most of the time he's talking about power. Uh, and ambition and avarice. These are all motives that we recognize as motivating some of our lower political types. But in Federalist 72, he talks about the love of fame, the ruling passion of the noblest minds. Uh, and this can only be achieved when you have someone whose ambition is more than just simply wielding power, but someone who wants to do great things uh, and can act uh, with dispatch either in times of national emergency or in foreign policy. Uh, these are the conditions under which a president will be motivated to take the kind of risks to his reputation and to his power uh, uh, for the sake of the common good. So all of this is bound up under the rubric of energy. Um, and if I can sum up what I've been saying now um, in a, just a brief uh, uh, final thought, it is that when we think in terms of the separation of powers and political chemistry, we think not only of checking and balancing our constitutional powers, but we also uh, should think about encouraging those ingredients of good government uh, that turn out to be a recipe, if I may continue this metaphor, for Republican success. And there you have it. Bon appetit. Thank you very much. Um, I did make that souffle. <laughs> Many practices. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yarbrough. Um, well, let's get to the Q&A session now. Uh, any of our audience members, we've already got a couple questions which have come in, but I encourage the audience continue to submit those questions and let's, let's get to them. Uh, our first question, Professor Yarbrough, involves the judiciary, uh, the so-called least dangerous branch. Uh, what role does the judiciary play in good Republican government? That's an excellent question. And in fact, when I teach this in my class, it almost always comes up. 
You know, you mentioned the Senate, you mentioned the president, and you can see how he's describing those institutions and the requirements of them in 37. The reason I didn't mention them is because he doesn't in 37, not because I don't think that they play no role in good government. They, um, they provide judgment and wisdom. These are people who are trained in the law. And one of the advantages of the American system of government is unlike Britain, we have a written constitution. And so when you have, when Congress passes a law, the president signs the law into uh, being, uh, you then have the question of whether that law accords with uh, the principles of the constitution. Have, for instance, can you find a place in Article One, Section One, that shows you what powers the Congress is exercising in passing such a law? And, uh, and the president signs it. So it is the task, the responsibility, if you will, of the uh, justices to exercise their judgment in holding the law up to the constitution. And the constitution being the fundamental uh, will of the people, that is the, uh, that is the, um, uh, interpretation that needs to prevail. Uh, Hamilton in Federalist 78 talks about this in a simple way. He says, when a law violates the manifest tenor of the constitution, but when a law doesn't violate only the manifest tenor, but perhaps some subtlety in the constitution, that is the job of uh, lawyers who are trained in the law. And, uh, and um, it's why Madison in Federalist 51 talks about the peculiar requirements, why they hold their um, offices for uh, good behavior, which in effect becomes lifetime, a lifetime uh, term or appointment. Uh, because it requires such um, uh, particularized or specialized knowledge of the law. So, uh, so yes, of course, there's a place for the judiciary in good government, especially when uh, when you have a written constitution. And the and uh, let me uh, to continue with that: the quality they bring, the virtue that they bring, is judgment. Well, let me pick up then from a point that you just made. We hear a lot of talk these days uh, and proposals, even. Uh, which advocate for term limits for members of Congress and for judges as well. However, Publius makes a few arguments for the importance of unlimited re-eligibility, for instance, in 72, regarding the executive. Regardless of Washington's precedent, we now have since 1951, the 22nd Amendment, which limits the president, of course, to two mm -hmm. terms. How, in your opinion, would limiting any Congress person's duration of office or any judge's time at the bench affect this chemistry of good Republican government? That's, well, they're very separate um, institutions. I think what I would say for term limits in Congress uh, to go back to uh, Federalist 50, I think it's 57, where Madison talks about the manly spirit of the American people, that if you don't like what you're representing, there's no point really complaining, oh, we've had this same person in office and they just keep running and that's all they do is keep running. Hey, you have the power to vote that person out of office. So you don't want to uh, limit good people from continuing to serve. I think it is true that the framers did not think that the office of the House of Representatives would be that thrilling that people would want to make a lifetime uh, uh, occupation out of filling that office. But we still we have the means of correcting that anytime we want if we organize. And again, um, uh, all of the qualities of good government presuppose that you have a citizen body that is 
um, educated, that has civic virtue. Um, civic virtue may not be the primary ingredient, but you can't you can't just rely on uh, people's uh, uh, monetary self interest. You have to uh, rely on their sense of um, what's good for the country. Whether these representatives are, are long past their expiration date and should be removed from office, but that is something that citizens can do. I, I and I would add to that that one of the uh, um, uh, provisions that Madison makes uh, when he's talking about trying to reassure people that the House of Representatives will in fact be responsive to the wishes of the people. He says that uh, the, the people we send to Congress will always uh, have to operate, the laws that they pass will be um, binding on them as well. That is not the case in many important instances. And I know for a fact that there is a constitutional amendment circulating that makes it a requirement that any laws that the Congress passes must be must be um, uh, must affect them as well. Must be binding on them as well. So that, for instance, they exempt themselves from sexual harassment charges. They have a slush fund for accusations of sexual harassment or um, uh, or worse and they buy people's silence with that. They should not have that. Nobody else has that. Uh, they exempt themselves from uh, um, Americans with disabilities. Uh, they exempt themselves from the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, and hold on to their own policies. So again, all of these things require a level of civic education as the, as the absolute um, background or foundation for a Republican government. Uh, you have to, you, you do have to keep an eye on what your representatives are doing. So I guess um, to go back to Federalist 49, where Madison talks about the need to venerate the Republic, I would say uh, the Constitution, excuse me, I would say, yes, we need to venerate the Constitution, but we also, to um, take a leaf out of Thomas Jefferson's book, we also need to be vigilant. Uh, perfect. Uh, one of our audience members, Joe, has asked for some direction regarding his civic education, I think. He asks, do you have any recommendations for commentaries on the Federalist Papers that are accessible to a general public? For students, for instance, who are engineers, not academics, nor political scientists. Um, it, oh, I, I'm sorry to say this off the top of my head. Um, uh, there are there are good general surveys, but I, why don't I send you a couple of suggestions when I have time to think about it, rather than just shoot from the lip. Excellent, and we can post those when we post this on YouTube. Sure. We'll throw those links down in the bottom. Okay, that would be good. Listen that would be check good. Them out. Yeah, then, yeah. Well, look, our next question is very much still in line with the last answer you've offered us. It's from another, an anonymous uh, audience member who asks, how does the Senate filibuster fit with the founders' analysis? Isn't, it is not a constitutional provision, but is it a feature of good government in your view? Um, it, it, as with everything else, it depends on what it's used for. Um, uh, it, one of the features of the Constitution is that the houses of Congress can write their own rules. Uh, and one of the things that I learned when I was working on my Theodore Roosevelt book is that the House of Representatives had a filibuster. And it was, in fact, Thomas Brackett Reed, who is a Bowdoin graduate, I'm happy to say, um, uh, Thomas Brackett Reed, who reformed the rules of the House of Representatives and made the filibuster go away. Uh, but it, it, it is um, in the Senate, and it, it seems to be consonant with the um, wishes of the Senate. And that goes both for, for both wings of our 
uh, partisan electorate, uh, those who are on the left and those who are on the right, that if you want moderate policies, if you want policies that lean more toward the center, having a filibuster uh, helps to promote that because you have to have what is often referred to as buy-in from the other party, people willing to cross over and support legislation. And once you get rid of the filibuster, you make it possible. And this is what we're seeing right now with the thinnest majorities in the House of Representatives in almost a hundred years and a tie in the Senate with the vice president only, the vice president alone breaking that tie and the presidency in the hands of uh, the Democratic Party, that you don't need any buy-in if you get rid of the filibuster. Now, if you think that democracy is simply a 51-49 proposition, then you would be in favor of getting rid of the filibuster. But it seems to me that when the wheel turns and the Republicans come back in office and you gotten rid of all of these super majorities, then you're just going to have the whole thing flip over again, and you will have the kind of mutability in legislation that, Je that Madison is warning against in 37 and in 62 and in 63. This is uh, very good. Thank you. This is our next question from an audience member. It, it reads, you spoke of Federalist 9 and Publius's saying the science of politics has received great improvement. Uh, has our political science since the time of the founding received even greater improvement such that warrants leaving behind Publius's political science? Well, um, the arts, uh, as we learn from studying Plato's Republic, the arts or even the sciences are morally neutral uh, and they can be put to good use and they can be put to bad use. I think there is no question that we have, um, what we have now is not so much um, uh, advances in uh, political science, because what Hamilton is talking about, and I think what Madison is talking about, are advances in political science that promote um, uh, a, a a liberal democratic society. And I don't mean that in the, in the narrow partisan sense of liberal, but people who are committed to the fundamental principles of equality and liberty, these are, these are our founding principles. And that also includes a free economy. And what you have now are people who have argued that we've moved beyond at the need for a free economy. And we've moved beyond the need for um, uh, 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 anything other than sheer majoritarianism. Um, uh, and so what you have, I would argue, is not so much advances in political science because there have been real, there have been real drawbacks in political science. And I'll give you just one small example of that, and that's jury selection. You know, nowadays, uh, uh, um, when you, it's supposed to be a jury of 12 of your peers, but it seems often as if it's a race to the bottom to get the people who are the least qualified to have to judge um, uh, these very important uh, criminal and civil questions. Um, uh, and, and there's a whole science to the art of jury selection. So you can say there's another advance in the science of politics, but is this necessarily a good one? Is all our polling, does our polling really advance our, um, uh, our civic, uh, uh, our, our sense of our civic duty? Uh, does the fact that we can now um, conduct more uh, that we can conduct uh, elections through the mail, 
because we have a more efficient mail system than we had in the 18th century. Is that such a hot idea? Um, I think uh, 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 there are lots of there are lots of ways in which one could argue no, these are not advances. But I think what I would argue overall is that what you have going on right now is a battle over socialism versus free enterprise, liberal democracy. And these are not this is not so much connected uh, or this is not fundamentally about institutions. It's about an overall understanding of what the purpose of government is and from which the institutions follow. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. And that leads us then to our final question tonight, Professor Yarbrough. Uh, as a student of the Federalist Papers, the American founding and American government, how's our chemistry doing? How are we doing today? I, <laughs> um, I, 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 it's such a long, I, I could give you a very long answer. I think one of the things that I have learned since I finished my Theodore Roosevelt book is that in addition to our written constitution, uh, the three branches of government, we have a whole, one could say almost a, um, a, second, a second constitution which operates. And that is the bureaucracy in Washington. And the separate and the bureaucracy in Washington, if you look at what the, the chief reformers who wanted to put the bureau, really strengthen the arm of the bureaucracy around the time of the uh, progressives uh, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, what they wanted to do precisely, and they knew this, was to overcome the limits on, of the separation of powers. So here you have a, a constitutional design that puts in place the separation of powers and not only checks power, but also promotes different qualities of good government. And then you've got a, an administrative state um, that is operating in Washington that has no separate, is not in any way limited by the separation of powers. The bureaucracy formulates its rules and regulations, it executes its rules and regulations, and if you don't like them and you want to challenge them, you wind up in administrative courts that are outside of Article 3. So what we've got now with this political chemistry, and I really feel very strongly that uh, for my colleagues who teach American government, that it's important to see that we have two rival governments going on. We've got the government that we were all taught about with its three branches of government, its separation of powers, its federalism. And then you've got the administrative state that tries to overcome the limits of this uh, of the constitutional system by um, uh, having an, uh, a, a bureaucracy that is not limited by the separation of powers. So both the limitations of the separation of powers and all those great qualities that I mentioned um, uh, are probably don't exist. What the argument for the administrative state was is that you would have impartial experts who could craft policies that would be untainted by local political interests. But it turns out that the bureaucrats themselves have very decided uh, interests of their own and they are not always or even most of the time so impartial. So what I'd say is that we've got two different chemistries operating there uh, and the situation is complex. I want to say a deflated souffle. You've been <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> 
To everyone who joined us this evening, we thank you very much for taking the time to discuss and think about the Federalist Papers and the American government with us. And to Professor Gene Yarbrough, we very much appreciate you taking the time to speak with us this evening. We hope you have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you.